uh, to produce the Grail mythology in some of these versions, namely the, the priestly versions, the Cistercian versions. So that um, now I have Bran was also said to have had a drinking horn, and if you look on your sheet, you'll see a picture of a drinking horn. There it is, and. Uh, this horn, the French word for, uh, the old French word for horn is cor, C-O-R-S. That's also the same word for body, C-O-R-S, as in corpse. And so Loomis suggests that there was a confusion or a deliberate misinterpretation of this horn, which if you drank from it, would supply you with any nourishment that you wanted. There was an identification of that with the body of Christ in, as the wafer in the mass. We find in Crachian that the grail is conceived of as a dish with a single wafer on it that feeds uh, the, the Fisher King's father. So uh, we have this, this gradual absorption of the native uh, tradition. There's also there, um, I want to draw your attention to this Gundestrup cauldron, which is uh, from Denmark, dating about the first century BC. And then if you flip the page, you'll find a picture of a panel from it of the uh, Celtic deity Chernunos. Now, Chernunos, uh, in that representation, he has the horns of an antler, and the antlers, uh, apparently the horns are shed annually, so that there's a sense of inexhaustible replenishment. And in one hand, he's holding a serpent. The serpent sheds its skin, and so replenishes itself inexhaustibly, like the moon does. And in the other hand, he's holding a golden torque, uh, which is, uh, I guess, a Celtic necklace. Uh, and it's the gold associates it with the solar power, which is eternal. So you have both of the powers there, the solar and the lunar, eternity and time. Now on the next page, you'll find a representation of the same deity, Trinunos, from a Gallo-Roman altar, where he is now holding a cornucopia, from out of which is pouring grain inexhaustibly. And two animals associated with the moon, the stag and the bull, are partaking of inexhaustibly. It was out of these Celtic symbols of cauldrons and cornucopias of inexhaustibility that the grail emerged. That it was, and was identified with, in some traditions, the tradition of the Eucharist. And uh, there's one other uh, drawing that I want to uh, draw your attention to on the following page. This is the Venus of La Salle from 40,000 BC in France, and she's holding up a horn in one hand, which may be the crescent moon, it may also be the horn of a bison, and it may not matter because they're identified. The, uh, the herds are slain and replenish themselves. They have to in order to keep the tribe alive, and the moon replenishes itself. So there's an identification of the two powers. Along with the woman's menstruation cycle, she's rubbing her belly, and the fecundity of the womb. So we have here a number of phenomenal, visible manifestations that are analogized to a single power that is inexhaustible. And if we partake of it, it will renew us as well and strengthen us. This is what the Grail symbolizes. The Grail is the portal, the gateway, where the energies of eternity come pouring into time. And when we're separated from that for too long, a wasteland results. Your life begins to dry up. You may suffer depression. You may turn to drugs or alcohol or whatever. But this wasteland experience uh, is what has happened. You've been cut off from that inexhaustible nourishment that is the center uh, within each one of us. That's the journey to the grail. It's the journey to this source where we find the inspiration for the spontaneity of our life. And we have to learn how to listen to that or uh, we get lost in the dark wood of Dante. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say about the symbolism of the, uh, the grail and the Celtic. One other point was... Um, Wolfram conceives of the grail, as we'll see, as a, as a stone. And so far as I know, this is the only version which conceives of it as a stone. He calls it the lapis exilis, the uncomely or unbecoming stone, the small stone. And uh, he mentions that the phoenix, it's the phoenix bird, uh, in relation to it, it disintegrates into ashes, and it is the cause of the resurrection of the phoenix bird. But I think what Waltham also has in mind is he wants to synthesize a number of ideas in your mind, one of which is the Kaaba, which is the, uh, the, uh, the fetish of the Islamic tradition. This is the Kaaba is to Islam, what the Ark of the Covenant is to the Jews, what the, the Eucharist is to the church. It's the central uh, sort of 
physical manifestation of uh, supernormal powers around which the whole religion revolves. But on the Kaaba, which was actually there long before the Mohammedan traditions, there is a, there's a black stone which was said to have been brought by the angel Gabriel to earth, which was originally white. And it has been stained black by the contact of human hands. You know, likewise, your soul can become stained black if by too much uh, materialistic concerns and not enough time for contact with those inner wellsprings. It's very important. So um, he wants you to think of that. He also wants you to think specifically of the Philosopher's Stone of Alchemy. I think even more so. Now, uh, the Arabs really perfected alchemy. They picked it up from the Greeks who invented it uh, in Alexandria in the first couple of centuries AD. And the Arabs picked it up and really brought it to um, as close to a science as you could term alchemy as being. And uh, the whole mythology was that um, they had a, a story that metals grew normally in the earth and would slowly ripen into gold in time. If they were left alone, they will become gold. That is the perfection that metals, all metals, are striving to become through time. So the alchemical process actually collapses this time factor and transforms the base metals into gold in a retort. But in order to do this, we need the Philosopher's Stone. So there's this mythology that this is the magic wand of alchemy. So there's this uh, mythology that the Philosopher's Stone, uh, all of this is based on, on Aristotelian philosophy as well, all the material in the world, this is before the atomist hypothesis comes in later, is supposed to be made up of the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. <coughs> and each process in space and time gradually turns into one or the other of these elements. So theoretically, everything is interconvertible into everything else if you know the formula for doing it. So you can take something like an egg yolk or a cow dung or something and put it in your laboratory and through a complicated um, and the alchemist Jabir was very mathematically precise about this. You could, through a complicated process of distillation after distillation after distillation, come up with a pure form of these four elements. And when they are combined, they will yield, if successful, the stone, which is the sort of fifth element from the unification of these primordial elements. And the philosopher's stone is usually conceived of as a powder or something. Uh, is what will enable you to transform the metals into the gold. But you've got to get the stone, and that's the hard part, to get the, the stone. <laughs> Not many people were successful at it. So, uh, but, now, what Wolfram wants you to think of is, uh, he is taking these alien traditions and fusing them with the Western mythology of the individual and saying, well, this is what happens to us in the West. Our personality goes through a process of maturation. It begins in a state of imperfection, which is Parsifal the Fool, leaving from his uh, mother's home in a state of total naivete, and through a long process in the alchemical retort of the forest, goes through a number of transformations of his psyche until he becomes matured. And that, when he reaches the Grail Castle and is invited back in, that represents the attainment of his earned character, his maturity, uh, tested in the alchemical retort of this, these adventures. So Wolfram very much wants you to think of this this. Uh, his story as a kind of psychological allegory for a slow process of perfection um, through time. This is what Schopenhauer calls earned character. This is something that uh, you find out about yourself. It's, it's innate, but you only find it out through the tests and trials of life. And uh, this, in turn, was based on the old Aristotelian idea of the entelechy. The entelechy is from the word telos, meaning gold. And the entelechy is Aristotle's conception of the soul. Every living thing has an entelechy. And it is that uh, spiritual principle which is responsible for maturing the acorn into the tree, uh, the, the body into the old man, and so forth. This is, the grail then is tied in with this through Wolfram's metaphors here to this notion of goals and perfection, and becoming what one ought to be. So that's what I wanted to say about this, the symbolism of the grail itself. Um, the next thing I wanted to, uh, to say was that, uh, just make sure I didn't 